Armor trains are most of their action in the 19th and 20th century, particularly in the First and Second World War. Yet the question is, why use armored trains in the first place? At first a bit of a definition. Saloga basically defines three types of railroad weapons. Armored trains, which are characterized by armored protection of their weapons and crew. Artillery troops eventually realized that trains could serve as platforms for extremely heavy artillery pieces. These weapons are usually called railroad guns but lacked armored protection. At the lower end of the spectrum are armed trains. These are simply troop or supply trains equipped with a few machine guns and sometimes a few sandbags for self-defense. In this video we'll look mostly at armored trains, yet to a certain degree also armed trains as well, since the transition can be quite fluid. To answer why armored trains were used and also why they are not really used anymore, we look at their strengths and weaknesses first. Finally, we add the historical dimension, namely the change of these factors due to new technologies and other elements that changed over time. Let us start with strengths. Now keep in mind here we are mostly looking at capabilities of trains in the time frame from the mid 19th century to 1945. The first element is they were fast or even very fast, especially considering their range and how much cargo they could carry if you look at World War II terms. We all know that the Panzerkampfwagen 6 Tiger was a heavy tank, yet they were mostly transported with trains. Yes, they needed special rail cars, but trains still transported several of them without much of a problem. Additionally, these trains were fast and quite reliable, especially in comparison with armored vehicles based on the combustion engines like tanks. Sadly, I have not found particularly data here, yet it seems that trains were far more reliable than cars or tanks, if we consider that they measured accidents per million kilometers past. The number of accidents per million train kilometers was 3.28 in 1937, rising to 5.29 in 1939 and 8.20 in 1943. As such, an armored train was a platform with strategic mobility that could carry a lot of weight, for instance heavy tanks. Of course, this also means they had enough capacity to carry troops, being equipped with armor plating, weapons, supplies, fuel, repair crews for the tracks and all kinds of other stuff that might be important to the mission or crucial to the war effort. Hence you could build a well protected, heavily armed train that was fast and had strategic reach yet also required relatively low maintenance. Furthermore, trains are inherently modular in their composition. What do I mean by that? Well, you can replace some of the gun equipped cars with armored passenger cars and you basically have an armored troop carrier, for instance, like the Russians did with their raiding tactics. Since 1915, it had become the tactic for Russian armored trains to dispatch small infantry sections on armored trains to disembark at critical points in the battle to clear enemy trenches or conduct other types of missions. In October 1919, this practice was amplified by instruction to assign each armored train a raiding team. The raiding team typically consists of an infantry company of 165 troops and a cavalry troop with 47 sabers supported by a machine gun section with two machine gun carts. Additionally, due to the carrying capacity, rail cars were also rather modular in terms of construction. For instance, existing weapon systems could be reused. This is particularly visible with German and Soviet armored trains of the Second World War, where they reused tank turrets like that of the Panzer IV or the T-34. Similarly, in some cases, complete tanks were put on trains and they could be deployed if necessary. Of course, there were also severe weaknesses to armored trains, as it would have been a wonder weapon. First off, trains are big, as such they are expensive, are big targets and have a rather long production time, so a significant amount of investment could be lost at once. This makes the second part even more important, since surprise, they are bound to tracks, which makes them rather inflexible when it comes to moving around. Additionally, this leads to number three, namely, that they are hard to hide due to their size, necessity to run on tracks and back in the days most of them ran on coal too, so they were easy to spot. Which leads to number 4. They are an easy target for ambushes. As noted by Zaloga referring to an incident in 1899 during the Second Boer War when a British armored train was successfully ambushed. This skirmish highlighted the vulnerability of armored trains to ambush and made it clear 
that they could not operate independently against a skillful enemy without their own reconnaissance force. Tactics and technology continued to evolve. Cavalry was often used to provide the root reconnaissance. Hence, the recon force makes operating an armor trim even more expensive. Of course, we must also tackle the obvious question or even paradox, as Malmazarai called it. Why not just remove the tracks and as such the armored trains are gone? Well, the simple answer is, if it was so easy, then armored trains wouldn't have seen continuous use in various conflicts from 19th century to the 21st century. The less simple answer is, of course, a bit more complex. First off, rail lines are an important infrastructure element. As such, usually both sides have at least some interest in preserving them to a certain degree. There were special vehicles that could destroy rail lines, but they were usually used as a last measure. After all, it is better to capture old onto the rail line than to destroy it. Second, it is not so easy to properly destroy a rail line. For instance, you hit a part of the line with a bump, so how much is destroyed? Well, probably a few meters. Even an unfortunate hit at connecting tracks would at most damage four tracks. After all, those are steel beams. Additionally, armored trains were in some cases equipped with reserve tracks and a crew to handle repairs. As such, this would have been only a temporary setback. Third, if we combine number one and two, if you can bring enough firepower and or firepower to extensively destroy a rail line, well, you probably have enough forces and capability to capture the whole thing for yourself. Of course, there were various measures and scenarios to damage railway lines. One of the most extensive and simplest was this example. In Indochina, the Viet Minh used the cattle from nearby villages to pull a section of rail to one side, the inertia effect of which would cause hundreds of meters of track to overturn, or else drag entire sections off to disappear in the jungle. The issue here is these rail lines were completely metal looking at the picture. I don't think this was possible with rail lines that used a combination of wooden and steel beams. Also, it seems that in that case the whole section could be put back in place at once again. Hence, damage was only a temporary setback as with other measures. Another technique from the American Civil War were the so-called Sherman's neckties, where the rails were heated and then twisted around trees, so that they would require new rails or significant repairs. This might have worked against the Confederacy, yet a more industrialized enemy just brought spare rails. One easy way to protect rail, rail lines was constantly and randomly patrolling them with trolley cars or similar small rail cars or rail capable vehicles. This could be vehicles that were moved by the crew physically pushing down and pulling up the walking beam, yet also repurposed military vehicles. The Wehrmacht used a variety of types of armored cars for rail scouting with their tires removed and replaced by steel wheels. Yet, back to the weaknesses, we are now at number 5, namely the vulnerability to air attack. This was less or better no issue initially, but was particularly a problem during World War II. Trains are very vulnerable to air attacks. For instance, Savodny notes that in 1944 in France, armored trains during the day had to hide in tunnels. To give one example, first, Panzerzug 25 was ordered back to the Toulouse area to the Rhone Delta. It was already in the tunnels near Cassis between Toulon and Marseille on August 19th, but could hardly move because of the total air supremacy of the Allies. On August 21st, it was attacked by low-flying planes near Nimes, causing losses. Of course, there are other issues, for instance, like mining the tracks, yet at least for contact mines, there were certain countermeasures, like using empty rail cars in the front of the train. Of course, trains could be and sometimes were heavily camouflaged, there were also smoke deflectors installed, yet generally once they were moving, they were hard to hide, as Malmazari notes. It should be noted that the maximum efficiency requires static non-moving machines emitting neither smoke nor light. The moment a tank or train begins to move, no camouflage can hide it. And all that can be hoped for is that land-based observers have a difficulty in determining its precise position and its nationality. Based on these strengths and weaknesses, we can also now derive certain requirements that are needed to successfully operate armored trains. Since these trains are expensive and hard to hide, they needed not only speed but also space to avoid being hunted down. 
Additionally, a weak infrastructure helped here since it reduces also the mobility of enemy troops. As such, the chances of massing firepower like artillery is particularly hard. Furthermore, if the railway line is the main lifeline, the enemy intends to capture it. He will likely limit the damage to the rails. Another point that naturally follows the other is a low force density, since a vast amount of space and bad infrastructure usually result in low force density. This is also clearly reflected by the Austro-Hungarian regulations from 1918 on how to use an armored train in the attack. When attacking an enemy position, the armored train is deployed in cover and supports the troops with a surprising fire attack. To avoid artillery fire, it performs changes of the position swiftly. Depending on the condition of the railways after the breakthrough, the armored train may advance into the rear or flank of the enemy, if necessary in combination with railway troops to ensure the operability of the rails. For more information on armored trains in World War I, be sure to check out this video on my main channel. Similarly, this is also expressed in the German army regulations about Panzerzüge from 1945 that notes under how to conduct combat, not continuous duty like railway artillery, but rather punches. It continues, do not leave weakly, literally thinly armored trains as targets for enemy tanks or enemy airstrikes. The basics are the same, keep moving. Although one can also see a change in the assessment of vulnerability that reflects the change in technology and the availability of certain weapon systems. Whereas in the first world where these trains were heavily armored in comparison with most land vehicles and thus artillery was seen as the main threat, in 1945 these armored trains, at least by this publication, were considered weakly armored. Similarly, if one looks at World War I, armored trains usually came without anti-aircraft armament. Initially this was also the case in World War II. Later armored trains of the Red Army and the Wehrmacht were usually equipped with anti-aircraft weaponry like quad 20mm flak or 37mm auto cannons. After World War II, armored trains did not completely disappear, yet they became even rarer as the logo notes. Armored trains were used in a number of conflicts after World War II, but clearly their day had passed. Typically, they were used in colonial conflicts or regional wars in remote areas where tanks and other armored vehicles were few in number. The Soviet and Polish armies used armored trains against the Ukrainian insurgent army in 1945 to 1949. The French army used armored trains for rail protection in the China conflict of 1947 to 1954 and again in fighting in Algeria in the 1950s. There were other conflicts as well, for instance the Belgian Congo, Soviet Chinese border crisis, Armenia, Chechenia and also in the Yugoslavian civil war both in the 1990s. Yet according to Malmazari, who wrote an encyclopedia on armored trains, there were also some used in Colombia. This is also related to the regular roles and missions that armored trains fulfilled. Savotny so lists a lot for German armored trains in World War II. These included security runs, escorting important transport, supporting attacked posts, protecting important railway facilities such as stations or bridges, securing track reconstruction works, tracking down and destroying partisan groups off the railway line, as well as the participation in larger partisan fighting operations by the deployable troops including the combat vehicles, by artillery support, by blocking the railway line against breakout attempts and as a communication control center. Irregular security runs of the armored trains had a deterrent effect at first. The partisans equipped only with light weapons did not dare to approach the routes patrolled in this way. As you can see, these are mostly focused on two aspects, logistics and controlling vast areas with limited resources. Occasionally armored trains would provide support for regular combat operations, but that was more the exception than the rule. As such, it is not surprising that these trains are mostly used in protecting lines of communication, fighting insurgents and colonial wars throughout their active time. This is also reflected by the use of German armored trains in World War II. In total, the Wehrmacht ordered about 70 armored trains during the war, with operational strength peaking at about 55 armored trains in 1945. Most of these operated on the Russian front or in the Balkans, though a few more captured by US and British forces in 1945 as the France collapsed. To conclude, why use armored trains? 
And as you have probably noticed, the why is very dependent on the circumstances. So it is more a when and why. Since more usually than not, our trains were not used at all or only to a very limited degree. So when and why I use armor trains? Armor trains can be a simple and vital instrument to protect railway lines, which usually functioned and still function as the main line of not only providing supplies to the combatants, but also goods for the economy. So they were and are to secure the lifelines of a faction, especially in areas with limited infrastructure, low population and low overall force density. This makes them ideal for colonial wars, but also the Eastern Front to the geographical, demographical and economical situation. Since they are rather reliable, fast and carry a lot, regular trains can be upgraded with makeshift armor and various kinds of weaponry that is already, already available as well. This again makes them more likely to be used where resources are limited. Of course, the dedicated construction of armored trains is also a possibility. Due to their combination of firepower, speed and range, armored trains are also ideal for patrolling large areas. They can also engage in combat either by directly engaging or providing fire support, yet generally only against the weaker enemy. As such, they can be used in a variety of roles from riot control, anti-partisan warfare, but at times also regular combat in symmetrical warfare. Furthermore, their large cargo space allows the transportation and deployment of troops, vehicles and even tanks while being covered by armored trains, something that might be crucial to turn a fight against limited number of enemies, but is rather useless if facing strong opposition. Yet to the various limitations, usually it is more why not use armored trains. Well, I hope you learned something new. Big thank you here to Andrew for reviewing the script, providing vital feedback, also providing information on the American Civil War. Thank you to all my supporters on Patreon and Subscribestar. As always, source the list in the description. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you for watching and see you next time.